Welcome to our first episode of Live from the Future, where we explore frontier tech that will change the world. I'm your host, Wissam Abdullah. You can find me on Twitter at Real Wissam. Unfortunately, Elon Musk could not make it today, but in his place, we have Matt Newberg from Hungary. Matt Newberg is the founder of Hungary, a media startup exploring the impact of technology on a relationship with food. Matt has spent the past eight years working in tech as an entrepreneur and product manager, most recently at Vimeo. He's now finally layering on his passion for food to explore the future of food. Before we jump in, this episode of Live from the Future is sponsored by Uber Eats. Get $7 off your first order using promo code EATS-UBER with Sam. Uh, Matt, thanks for joining today. Thanks for having me, man. Let me take a moment to teleport us both to the future together. Whoa. I think I feel it. All right. It is now October 2029, 10 years from now. Paint me a picture of what the world of food looks like today. Today being 10 years from now, 2029. Uh, What are the biggest changes from where we're at today? Yeah. There's going to be a lot of changes I see. Um, Where do we start is the question. I mean, I see the convenience trend really... uh, really taking over and people really consuming food uh, outside of the home. And what that looks like is kind of tech companies have become food companies and they've basically created vertical supply chains to, um, you know, create, uh, to, to make fresh prepared food for you in a centralized kitchen that gets, uh, you know, that's personalized to your, your nutrition. Um, and it's available within five or 10 minutes. Uh, delivered via well, this is a hotly debated topic, but it's uh, <laughs> delivered via drone. Yeah, we talked about um, some lunch yesterday. De- delivered from a conveyor belt or the, <clears throat> the pneumatic tubes underneath your uh, uh, underneath your lawn. Okay, um, so let me let me pick up on something you said there. So the big thing that I took out of that was the vertically integrated piece. Yes. Obviously, today, not twenty twenty nine, twenty nineteen, we have. Uh, virtual kitchens, the start of it. We've mm-hmm. got delivery networks um, and on-demand food. Mm-hmm. You were saying that 10 years from now, it's all going to be one company that one company. vertically handles all that. Like you think Uber's exactly. going to be making food? An Amazon or a Cloud Kitchens or an Uber would be the ones doing everything soup to nuts, basically making the food, um, marketing the food, um, you know, prepping it and sending it off to your doorstep. Making some food. last mile transportation network. What that last mile transportation network is, is beyond my uh, pay grade. But um, <laughs> I'm bearish on that being fully autonomized in 10 years. Um, so I would say look at micro mobility as an option for that. Um, I want to talk about that. The yeah. bearish on fully autonomized. Yes. Uh, before we talk about that, though, let's close the loop on the on the, the fully integrated piece, why is it sure. that you think Uber, Amazon, whoever it is, will be doing fully integrated, top-down, making mm-hmm. the food? The more I talk to restaurateurs, the more um, it feels like a parasitic relationship between tech platforms and, and restaurateurs. Mm. And um, and it's a David and Goliath game. And I think we know what's going to happen is there's less people putting money into restaurants figuring this stuff out than there are tech companies figuring this out. And, um, you know... Tech, comp- tech has been the greatest driving force of our economy. And uh, I just see that just continuing into every vertical and it's going to be food is, is this next, re- you know, revolution. And that's why I've kind of dedicated my life to exploring this. So in that world, David's, Uber's, Amazon's <laughs> actually win where they take over. Like it's not enough to like be overloading restaurants today with their demand and taking onerous cuts, but they're actually going to start making the food and just cut the restaurants out altogether. Yeah, yeah I think like V1 of this um, is, uh, you know, I think in a year you're going to see Costco is going to sell you the same pizza that you've enjoyed, but with robots. But like the next iteration is that that robot company builds its own restaurant from scratch, learns what it can from working with Costco. That You know, there's a pilot going on right now with Just Salad where robots making salads for Just Salad. But ultimately, I think the one who wins is the one who figures out how to combine seamlessly combine all the technology and the food in a way that um, is a magical experience and does it in a way that um, optimizes for costs. And at each step in the supply chain, there's, there's margin lost for, 
restaurateurs or tech companies, whatever. And so the most efficient ways to, in a low margin environment with food, we're going to demand it faster, cheaper, more nutritious. The best way to get that is to combining, you know, all these different areas into one, one umbrella. And that's going to be uh, very difficult to do because like food and tech is oil and water mixing together. Mm. Um, I can definitely see a world where some of these large tech companies get into the food game. I mean, if you look at Travis Kalanick's yeah. cloud kitchens, they already have the warehouse space, sure. all the equipment. I mean, it's not a massive step for them to just hire a contract right. chefs, kitchen people, restaurant people and make yeah. good food. Yeah. This is something that David Chang talked about in your first episode of Hungry, yeah. Hungry.tv. Yeah. Um, he said that on-demand food economy is going to kill middle-class restaurants. Yes. I guess using your David and Goliath analogy, mm-hmm. we said that David is likely going to win and start, you know, soup to nuts, um, making the food, delivering the food to their network of buyers and all of that. Um, what happens to the, sorry, Goliath wins in that example. Yeah, I wasn't going to correct you, but. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, allow me to continue using the thin correct metaphor. <laughs> <laughs> We're only doing one take here. <laughs> exactly. Um, what happens to the Davids, the restaurants, the small restaurant right. tours, the ones that are on Uber Eats today, little mom and My pop shops? David. Yeah, David I mean, we, we went to Forma yesterday. They're yes. on Uber Eats. What, what happens to... Forma. Maybe Forma is not a good example. Forma's QSR pe- pe- is fine. People will still go there and sit down and eat lunch with their buds. Yeah. What happens to the, the little mom and pop shops that are on Uber Eats today when Uber starts making their own burgers? They're going to become Uber drivers or whatever that, <laughs> whatever that job is, sadly. There's, there's going to be other ways for people to earn a living in this economy. I just talked to a startup that's basically allowing people, instead of being Uber drivers, to run nano fulfillment centers in cities that are going to service the last, not the last mile, but the last couple of yards, hundreds of yards. Mm. Um, for e-commerce products, dry goods, plus like basically a mini Amazon warehouse in your yeah, apartment, plus and like fresh food or you know some sort of CPG product that's not necessarily fresh. I would it would be something with like uh, a decent a, a, a long enough shelf life. They can have cold storage in them, um, but you know they're per- currently partnering with direct to consumer brands to give you the, the these products, and you know. 10 minutes um, to your doorstep instead of you having to wait a day or two for them to come on Amazon and they're going to, they're going to be cold or frozen or whatever they are. Um, And, and the people that are going to power that are going to be the same types of people who were previously Uber drivers. So I think, you know, it will evolve uh, where they're going to go away. I mean, the mom and pops will go away. Sad to say, I mean, you know, maybe some of them will adapt and they'll come up with, um, you know, modular kitchens instead of food trucks and they'll, They'll figure out how to optimize their costs and and generate demand. Um, And I think, you know, I don't think every mom and pop goes away, but I think the general landscape is it's going to be few and far between. Um, It's just going to be impossible for them to keep up with um, what what will be created over the next 10 years. What I'm seeing being formed today is not something that they're going to be able to compete against. Um, The high-end fine dining will be fine, because people want to experience and and that's tech tech can play a role in the experiential piece but it, you know we're, what we're generally dealing with is something that's consumed at home on demand uh at a certain price point you know people are going to start paying even more and more and more money for these crazier experiences um and i see them every day and it's super super innovative and super cool but we're talking about the nomas of the world the hundreds of dollars of per person it's a, it's going to be a luxury this is going to be like going to a broadway sushi play. is Sushi you? Yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. In Tokyo. And then and, and then on the on the low end of that, you have, you know, QSR, fast casual. You know, fast casual would be the only option for where you would go and congregate with a friend or a family member to enjoy a meal, sadly. And I personally prefer going to mom and pop restaurants. But that's just not gonna be we're, we're the way consumers have decided to vote with their dollars is driving us towards the cloud kitchen model, and that's just gonna be the prevalent model. Um, so I've, I've been to small mom and pop restaurants where you walk in and you see like six iPads for all the like delivery services that they're hooked up to. <laughs> restaurants empty. Yeah. But the kitchen's screaming, right? You see like order, 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 going out, 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 out. And I mean, I think that's already the truth of a lot of mom and pop restaurants. Yes. 
your prediction of the future 10 years from now is it's not going to be those mom and pop restaurants. They're just going to be gone. They're not going to be paying for that expensive prime retail location space. Right. It's going to be the Ubers and the Amazons and whoever owns the network. Yeah. That's just going to be making that food in virtual kitchens. Yeah. In lower cost space. Lower overhead environment. Uh, fewer fewer partners to deal with. Yeah. Um, Because right now, restaurateurs pay 30% commissions to these platforms to do the fulfillment. And, and, um, or the consumer chips in a little bit on the fulfillment side, but they're taking, you know, pretty hefty cut and and they're netting nothing and they're still paying prime rent. So, and, and, uh, so it's just not working regardless of the platform. You know, you're just ultimately, it's a wash. You're getting cash flow, but you're not generating any dollar back to your business. And so, it's going to be impossible for them to survive because we see an environment where 60% on average, like a lot of these classes of restaurants, especially the more fast casual restaurants, 60% is off premise of sales, meaning it's not consumed wow. at the point of sale. So that means, you so know, 10 years why, from now, I mean, that's just going to keep going yeah, how towards does that 100. Get any better? Yeah. They're going to shut down exactly. and they're just going to be made in offsite virtual kitchens. Yeah. I mean, like David Chang says, I want to be hopeful because I, we obviously, he and I both love that kind of stuff. Uh, we thrive off of it, but. It's just like if you if you're gonna be so busy and jam your schedule up and and demand that everything comes to you, well, th- this is what we get. And you know, we we live in this society where this is this is now the norm. Let's talk about the delivery part. Yeah, <clears throat> you said that you're bearish on what the the last mi- mile of automation looks like. <laughs> we talked about this a bit yesterday over lunch. Okay. Um, remember, we're talking ten years in the future, right? So, I mean, today. Uber Eats is ubiquitous. You've got, you know, we live in New York. I'm sure you see every day this like horde of, <clears throat> excuse me, delivery bikers everywhere, right? Mm-hmm. What does that look like 10 years from now? How is our food getting from an Uber or an Amazon mm-hmm. offsite virtual kitchen to my doorstep? <laughs> Some of the early things you can see is uh, I like I like to call them urban campuses. I think urban campuses are a great way to learn about the future and study the future um, because and, and an urban ca- campus could look like a hospital, could look like a huge tech company, like an Apple campus, anything with a campus, right? Where you're saying the Facebook campus, a large the group Microsoft of people campus, in a smaller thousands pace. of people who are all employed or work at in a particular business park or whatever. Okay. Um, what about communities like my apartment building and the ones near me? Does that Kibbutzes. fit? Okay. Uh, sorry. Um, no. Does does do do those apartment buildings fit into that? If there's enough residents, it's like <clears> I'm <throat> seeing in Brooklyn, like there's in Williamsburg, there's like buildings on either side of yep. a street, right? Sure. You have Sixth Street and Seventh Street entrances. Yep. Yeah. I mean, as as long as there's enough demand there, I could see potentially there being in a little micro economy. But yeah. basically what I'm getting at is there's going to be these centralized kitchens, like, you know, the, the dark kitchens, and then there's going to be the robots, the, you know, the delivery drones that are not flying in the air. They're, they're autonomous little ro- roving delivery bots. Uh, they're, they're like a couple wheel. Are they four wheels? I don't know how many four wheels. wheels. And like the little, the uh, spaceship.xyz. Uh, yeah, starship.xyz. Starship.xyz. Starship's basically launching in a bunch of different college campuses and they're enabling people to get uh no longer do you have it delivered to an address, you have it delivered to a pin. So you drop wow. a pin and you're like, "Give me my sandwich." That's pretty cool. So, yeah, that's what the future looks like. I mean, it looks like cheap commoditized delivery food 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 designed for delivery sold uh, at a at a very low price point that delivered as cheaply as possible on some sort of you know micro mobility platform or uh, off of those kinds of um roving you know off of those um robots that are going to be delivering the food um on a, in an urban campus i don't think that could get outside of that campus for a long time um obviously you know domino's has like, experimented with it postmates you know they all actually probably using the same equipment um yeah, I think part of the problem when I've looked into this space is that um, those little cute robots, there's only so many meals they can actually fit, right? And if you're delivering mm-hmm. to like my apartment building in Williamsburg, mm-hmm. you're not going to send a bot from like some far off dark kitchen right. in Bushwick to deliver me one no. meal. I think we're going to have to see more batching, especially if 10 years from yeah. now, it's the norm where I'm coming home after work, you're coming home after work, and we're all ordering our on-demand yeah. salads from Sweet Greens or whatever. Um, I wonder if that's a larger autonomous delivery vehicle 
<laughs> you said you're bearish. Is it the autonomous part yes. of it that you're bearish on? Yeah, it's the legal hurdles. That will ten years from now, you, you think that years. looks different? I think it's thirty it's years decades. from now, forty 30 years, years from now, now maybe different. Yeah, thirty when years from when now, we're it's grandpas. There. I think we're there in thirty years. Uh, <clears throat> I don't think we're there before then. Okay, that's fair. Maybe twenty some odd years. Um. Cool. I mean, today, more and more of my friends, and I'm sure yours as well, are already cooking less and less. I personally love to cook and cook often. Yeah, good for you. In this new world where people can get a robot to deliver their sandwich to them at their exact pin, and people are cooking less and less and less and less, what place do, do kitchens in the home take? Like today, like my kitchen takes up like 20% of my apartment, mm-hmm. right? And if you think about... A new build apartment, you know, 100 units, 20% of the building is kitchen space. Mm-hmm. And let's say that, you know, 80% of people aren't actually cooking. It's, yeah. it's a lot of dead space. Yeah. What do you think the future of that looks like yeah. 10 years from now? It's a great question. I think landlords could actually will benefit from that because they won't have to outfit kitchens and design them and whatnot. Yeah, kitchens are expensive parts mm-hmm. to build, all the, the appliances and stuff. Yeah, you got a bad tenant and like messes up your refrigerator. You know? <laughs> but um, Starts a fire. You could take. You could start subsidizing those tenants with uh, credits on uh, Amazon or Cloud Kitchens menu or whatever. Yeah. Or there can be companies that try. You know, we were talking about, you know, effe- effectively trying to build an outpost model uh, for the home and do those in in larger residential buildings. I mean, you, you could build like you know delivery lockers um, where people will get their food delivered in mass and just pick up whatever they ordered. And it's all coming from the same kitchen. Um, that just all depends on the variability of demand. It, it's easier to do that in a commercial setting, like an office building, because people generally tend to eat similar times. Yeah. Um, but yeah, for those who aren't familiar, that outpost model, which Sweetgreen has basically raised it, a $1.6 billion valuation off of, which we can talk about later. Yeah. Uh, Venture off- money for salads. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> is off of this idea that a wooden shelf um, would house um, dozens of salads made in virtual kitchens and delivered for free, and that that free delivery would just be able to be enough to incentivize people, hey, I'm not going to leave my desk. I'm going to just order this thing by 1030 in the morning or whatever it is, and Sweetgreen gets the order, they batch it all up, and then they ship it all out from the virtual kitchen. And it's no impact on their brick-and-mortar retail operation. There's no, you know... Uh, loss as far as like you know slow down and from that um if they were doing it out of the retail it would be very difficult to, i think to fulfill um yeah i was reading last night that they want to open 2000 new outposts by the end of next year that's um, insane yeah it's a lot i think that's what their model's banking on i don't know what the retail space looks like like i went to mm-hmm. sweet greens today yes here in meatpacking you know we're surrounded by some of the world's biggest brands paying very, very expensive mm-hmm. real estate lease and you've got a sweet greens. I mean, there's probably some economic advantage there where they can just shut down those retail locations and instead mm-hmm. deliver my salad to a outpost here that's made, yeah. you know, 20 minutes away in much cheaper space. I mean, yeah, the... the, the, the Jersey. <laughs> yeah. It's, I actually visited the Cloud Kitchen spaces around New York City. I know where they are. Okay. They're going to be in Tribeca or Midtown or Long Island City. Actually, the Midtown. But one, not ground level prime no. real estate that a Sweet no. Greens is now. They're going to be in like the old, no. you know, clothing factories. They're going to be or in something. garages. They're okay. going to be subterranean. And, um, no, subterranean. Yes. Cool. But the, yeah, the ground floor will still exist. You'll still have to have an experience, experience in which I, what I think is going to happen is they'll have to downsize the footprint and to eliminate most of that common, that, that front sit down space. And start sharing it with other tenants. So that we're out in meatpacking. So we're uh, looking at Gansevoort um, between Hudson and um, 10th, 9th Avenue. And uh, in that little, you know, there's that whole pavilion where, where there's a bunch of outdoor seating. Assuming that it's not like downpour, torrential downpour, you know, there's no reason why all those storefronts could just literally share that, all that common space. Mm. And that's kind of a draw for all of them. They'd be yep. there and they're going to be paying less rent. Um, I think that's ultimately the only way it's going to work. I was in Boston a couple of weeks ago and there was a, I was a, a little bit outside of Boston. And um, there's this mall there. Not really a mall. It's like, yeah, it's a pretty cool retail it's a it's a it's a mall. And it's basically two stories. And there, there there's a bunch of like 
food vendors there and none of them have any sit down. They're all, they're all what I would effectively call kiosks and they're just kitchens with like little drive through window, you know, little like uh, pickup windows. Yeah. And um, that's the future. I mean, there, if you're going to do a physical, <clears throat> pick, you know, sit down experience, it should be like a shared front of house effectively, unless it's fine dining. Um, so for, for a lot of quick service, fast, casual brands, I think that's, you're going to see like modular kitchens take that form, which are effectively food trucks without the, without the wheels, without the engines. Um, you know, they're, they're, they're just kitchens. They got a window that slides up and down and everyone's got to sit outside and they can do delivery out the back. But most of the delivery will be done from the cloud kitchens and it won't be done by those people. It'll be done by other, other tech players. What, um, what does the future of food robotics look like in that, mm -hmm. in that lens? Like you mentioned kiosks and I right away thought about a uh, new startup in LA called Ono. Oh which no. Is, oh no. <laughs> which Sorry. Is, <laughs> which is doing, um, they're like a robotic smoothie food truck. Yes, so. I'm very, I just watched their piece on the ABC News. Oh, I didn't see that. That's yeah, very cool. I should have sent it to you. I'll include it in the show notes. Okay. Um, it, it may have been a different, news. It, it could have been CBS. I don't know. Um, yeah, when you talked about kiosks, I mean, it made me think about that. Kiosks, sort of like you think self-contained and like easier to pop a robot in, like very much like uh, Jason Calacanis's robot Cafe X as well. It's like a little kiosk yes. with like a robot coffee barista. Mm -hmm. um, yep. Let's switch gears and talk about robots. You want to talk about robots? Let's talk about I, robots. I got, I got plenty of stuff on robots. Okay. What, uh, what does the future of robotics look like 10 years from now? Yeah. In food. I mean, we've been talking about yeah. robots in food for a long time. It seems like we're mm -hmm. finally starting to see the first little bits of it, yeah. right? The two that I mentioned, Ono yeah. and Cafe X, but also mm -hmm. companies like um, Zoom, the pizza robot. Yeah, who's pivoted away from that, by the way. Really? Yeah, I mean, I think there's there's been like, you know, there's there's like any new trend. There's there's the the early adopters that, you know, they define the market and... I think it's actually been a pretty pretty rough time for them. Um, I've heard pretty bad things about what's going on with Cafe X and and Creator, the burger, um, the robotic burger startup in in um, San Francisco. I mean, they're all in San Francisco. What are the struggles? Well, number one, <laughs> running a restaurant is hard, and number two, adding robots to the equation <laughs> is a huge capital expenditure. So, you know. Building a restaurant and then expecting it to be better economically because you don't have the labor piece doesn't solve all the problems of just the variability of that business. I mean, it just, it's, it's, um, just solving for one little piece of the equation and kind of shoehorning it into a existing box of retail. Um, yeah, there was a tweet the other day that got, some virality to it. I had in my show notes, but yes, it's disappeared. The Tom Goodwin one. Where? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, yeah, you should read it. It's pretty good. It's it's not shown up in my notion. Oh shit! <laughs> <laughs> it was something like um, restaurants are paying, and this is an over exaggeration, but it was like five hundred thousand dollars for robots to yes. replace people that work ten dollar an hour jobs and require now fifteen twenty thousand dollars. Yeah, now fifteen in New York <laughs> and require twenty thousand dollars a year yes. in maintenance. I don't know if these robots actually cost $500,000, but something we talked no, about yesterday is, I mean, restaurants are very capital intensive. Usually it's not, you know, um, there's usually not a lot of money, especially behind like small mom and pop shops. Like mm -hmm. why would you buy a robot to run it when you can just like spend zero CapEx and just pull some cook off of right. wherever the hair cooks. I was going to say off of the street, but it didn't sound right. Off of wherever to cook yes. for $15 an hour. Yeah, I mean, it's a CapEx, OpEx kind of uh, trade-off. Yes. That's all it is. It's a finance. It's not really that innovative. I mean, people have tried to put the, the robots in the front of the house and say, oh, look at my like robotic salad company. And I think what they've learned is that consumers really don't give a shit about whether, you know, they're, well, not that they don't give a shit. They would probably enjoy the price point of a cheaper salad. But like, I'm not going to go to Spice in Boston and eat a Daniel Balud uh, designed recipe that was made by a robot 
you know, I mean, Matt Newberg would because Matt Newberg loves the future food <laughs> stuff. But, you know, the average person who's out in Boston that's looking for a lunch place with their buds, that place was not very packed when I was there. Yeah. And that's not creating a draw. Um, and so I think all these guys open up in San Francisco, at, you know, in this in this very rosy time we're living in and said, oh, it wouldn't be awesome if we did this, but with robots. It's like, no, actually, no. <laughs> uh, so I think they're missing the boat. And um, So where are we going to see robots then? 10 years from now, twenty In the back of the house. I mean, like, the they'll, house. Be in, they'll be in the back of the house. You know, like, they're already, for Cloud Kitchens, like, they, that's what they hired all the Tesla engineers is to build a lot of the conveyor stuff. Mm. Um, I don't know about the actual automating of the food itself for that business. But yeah, I have a friend who has a company um, that is that is currently overseas that is experimenting with dark kitchens plus uh, robotics. And, and they're using the similar technology that um, Spice raised their $20 million round off of. But they were able to do it for a tiny, tiny fraction of that cost. Um, you know, less than a percent. I mean, it's insane. Uh, I think a lot of this hardware will become commoditized and it will just have to be applied. And that's where okay, so that it becomes takes an art. care of that. Tom Goodwin tweet as well, where you're not paying five hundred thousand dollars, right? It's it's oh, a commodity. No. It'll it come makes down. sense. Yeah. And you're you're what? You're starting the restaurants with robots. You're not retrofitting. Like it's cheaper to just be like, hey, we're building a robot back a house mm-hmm. and we're gonna do that. Yeah, I think you're gonna have to design a, a whole different kitchen for that. I mean, like think about how hard it is to just change your menu for a new dish. You need to like think about, you know, how much time people in the back of the house are spending like going for this recipe, going for this item or, you know, prepping this. I mean, it, it, I think it will have drastic implications on the on the physical real estate of it, um, you know, and just the entire, yeah, it will impact the entire experience of, of the food, but it won't be so transparent to the end user that it was made by a robot. But, um, you know, it will dictate the menu for sure. Got you it. know, it will definitely, I mean, that's 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 how it's got to work. So when we think about cutting costs, um, from my perspective, there's sort of two sides of it when we're talking about food. One mm-hmm. is labor costs, which is the back of the house stuff we're talking about. Mm-hmm. Uh, but we can also look upmarket, upstream, at the food costs. There's mm-hmm. some nascent ag tech robots that are coming out. There's mm-hmm. like the apple harvesting bot, um, abundant robotics. Mm-hmm. Uh, have you seen much in that space? And when any any yeah. predictions on... On what the oh yeah upstream food making ten years from now looks like, and how that yeah. changes, and robotics and other things we've talked about. Yeah, I think robots play a world. Play, sorry, play a role in this existing world for like harvesting and picking and whatnot. But I'm really excited about microbial fermentation um, and what that will do to the price of meat. And I think it will tell me about microbial. My yeah. microbial fermi- fermentation. <laughs> um, I am, yes, I'm no expert in this whatsoever. And I'm literally just getting up to speed. But the idea is that you will be able to um, effectively, through fermentation, um, you know, um, build scaffolding of new kinds of proteins um, that were formerly, you know, once only able to be sourced from animals and in, infuse inject those with um you know cellular based uh products like um memphis meats which we have up here uh or uh plant based proteins and just form um a much better product i mean it, it's basically turning um factory farming into food as software uh we'll have scientists design um molecules and upload them, and food designers will take them and um, and create new types of, uh, or they'll, they'll they either try to mimic existing proteins or create new new ones. So this is the synthetic dairy, synthetic it's eggs synthetic. that we're already seeing today. Synthetic, the wrong word there. Yeah, synthetic. I mean, well, same def- like same molecular structure, it's plant- but it's like it's made it's fungus made I in mean, a lab. Yeah. Is it still eggs though? Like, is it like? Well, it depends how you define it. I mean, it's. Um, <laughs> Or milk. So, like, you There's know, breast if I milk take two, one startup is doing. It's you said breast milk. One one startup is doing breast milk. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it could be anything. I mean, it depends. Like, it's like breast milk without the mother. It's chickens without. The, it's eggs without the chicken. It's 
Is it real? Yeah, it's Richard, real. Sort of the, you take the cells. What came first question? <laughs> <laughs> um, definitely the mother came first. Um, yeah, in case, but in sure. this case, it's unclear. Um, um, anyway, it's it's going to pose a lot of interesting ethical questions of like how to label stuff, but it will be like kind of one to one because you're taking the cells and you're you're getting whatever you need to get. Yeah. Without the actual carcass and the body of the the animal that created it, and so we're going to be be able to create like higher quality, more better, more nutritious proteins using microbial fermentation going forward. Fungi, um, fungi. It's a very powerful thing. Cool. Which, yeah, I just saw the uh, Fantastic Fungi movie, and I'm just uh, was pretty wowed by it. Is it good. Yeah, it was pretty interesting. I mean, it's very visual, very visually cool. My only pushback to that movie was that it was kind of it didn't cover too much too too much as much as I would like in the food space it was more talking about mushrooms as a you know a healer a healer and how we need to kind of you know one thing I do find really interesting was that how they talked about you know um, this kind of innate intelligence this natural intelligence of fungi that exists in the world and how like you really can't engineer anything as crazy as these fungi and these mycelium network that basically provides nutrients to um to trees underground it's an mm. insane network and there's this natural intelligence within within this fungus that um you know that we're kind of we need to understand as human beings and figure out how to leverage because it can help us solve a lot of our climate issues uh for example big oil spills um they were talking about like how fungi basically got in got into the uh into the ocean and and was able to get tons of this oil out out and it just kind of um turned it into another form which was able to be scooped out um and i'm no science i don't really understand biology that well in science i didn't really do great in um in high school but um i need to uh understand the inner inner workings better but um so basically fungi are the future I think fungus <laughs> is definitely something I'm paying close attention to. Cool. Uh, let's switch gears to lightning round. So five really short questions. Right. Just give us your top of the mind, what you think about these things. Uh, book, or mo- book or a movie on the future of feud that you've read or seen recently that you can't mm-hmm. shut up about? Mm-hmm. I was just saying Fantastic Fungi. Is that on Netflix? Um, it's a super limited release. So it's only in on certain, Netflix. No, it's just oh. in, in, in movies, r- theaters right now. But I, I don't know where it's going to go. You went to a theater and watched this. Yeah, nice. Yeah, so it's a pretty small scale release. Um, I think reading a book called Future Food right now, which is pretty interesting. It, it starts out talking about um, a slice of pizza in New York City and picking apart all the different ingredients and tracking it back to the source. And it's pretty fascinating. Uh, and I think it's pretty current. So I definitely recommend that one. That's cool. We can include a link to that. Yes, will do. Uh, fave food tech startup that you've seen recently. Right. Um, I definitely think Prime Roots and Ecovative are, are the, you know, these two kind of fungus um, players in the market that are, you know, basically fermenting mycelium and, and creating all sorts of crazy new, I mean, their existing products like bacon and shrimp and whatnot. Um, I'm excited to see where it goes and, and consumers adoption of it. Um, so those those are some stuff I'm uh, too I'm looking at closely. Uh, any cities that are leading the pack on food innovation and why? Hmm. I think you're going to get different things from different cities. I think you know Chicago is like CPG hub uh, just because of you know the history of CPG there. Um, all the major food companies are there. Mondelez, um, uh, what else? Kellogg's. I mean, like all the big food companies, they all have their own. Their own incubators now over there. Yeah. So there's a lot of corporate money, um, corporate innovation that would happen there. Startups could be anywhere. I mean, LA's got, New York is great for brand. LA's got, um, you know, obviously uh, uh, from an ag perspective, you know, it's, it's a huge opportunity there. Yeah. Um, from a brand perspective, there's a huge opportunity. You know, health and wellness is big on both coasts. Um, but definitely in LA is, is I think is is where that's really happening. And you can see Beyond Meat and Impossible over in California. Um 
That was my next question. Mm. Uh, uh, Impossible Meats and Beyond Burger. What do they mm. look like for 10 years from now? They look like McDonald's. <laughs> M- meaning? Meaning they look like shit. <laughs> um, no joke. Sorry, Greg. <laughs> <laughs> I just think there's going to be better options and, that are healthier. I think we, get, we, we, we love to like cheer these companies when they're small and they're innovative. But I think we're going to see them like, you know, Either they adopt new technologies or they, you know, continue sourcing ingredients the way that they do. Um, but, it, you know, we look at something that's highly processed today and we criticize it because it's coming from a big company. We look at a small company that's taking something that's highly processed and we just don't give a shit. Because it's cool because it's a small company. And yeah. it's a oh, middle finger to like whoever was the incumbent. And I think 10 years from now that, I mean, it's already wearing off. It's going to wear off. It's going to... So either they either they figure out like other types of technologies they're going to adopt or, or they become like part of the problem. Got it. Uh, last question. A slice in New York City. Oh, man. Um, <laughs> I'd say Patsy's in East Harlem and, and uh, you know, they actually have like a little slice spot on the side. Okay. But you got to schlep all the way up there. Okay. So anytime you want to go, just hit me up. Well, I mean, we, we might have our, to. I'm feeling pretty hungry after this episode. <laughs> I mean, I'm always hungry, man. <laughs> all right, man. Thank you very much for joining me today. This was Thank really you. fun. Good chatting. Thank you. Thank you.